I have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker, um, who I'm sure is a familiar face to most of you, but um, we will give her an introduction anyway, even if you already know her. Um, Deborah von Zinkernagel serves currently as the Principal Deputy Global AIDS Coordinator in the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, which is the coordinating office for the implementation of PEPFAR. Um, and we're very excited to have her here to tell us a little bit about, from PEPFAR's perspective, the future of the PEPFAR program and the U.S. response to HIV and some of what um, PEPFAR has been thinking about since they've had a little bit of time to start digging into the report. Um, Deborah previously served as the Vice President for Policy and as a senior clinical expert with the Pangea Global AIDS Foundation, um, where her work focused in uh, many countries that are also PEPFAR countries. Prior to that, she was the Deputy Director of the Office of HIV AIDS Policy at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And before that, spent some time as a Senate staffer, both as a committee staffer and in the office of Senator um, Edward Kennedy. So thank you very much for coming and sharing your perspective, and we look forward to hearing from you. Hopefully your slides will work. Hopefully. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure uh, to join you here today, together with a number of my colleagues from the partner agencies uh, uh, from uh, HHS, USAID among them. Uh, and uh, CDC, so we're, uh, we're delighted to be here and really uh, looking forward to this discussion. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Ambassador Eric Goosby, who heads our program. Uh, he's uh, since his regrets he couldn't come here today, but he's, uh, he's, he's going to grill us upon our return. Uh, so um, we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, first off, I want to say an uh, enormous debt of uh, thanks and gratitude to the Institute of Medicine, uh, to the committee that led this work, and to everybody who reviewed it. Um, an enormous accomplishment uh, that's unprecedented, just thousands and thousands of hours. I know we've met in countries at odd moments when teams were out there doing interviews, uh, and we know how hard you've uh, worked and, and how thoughtfully you've put this together. Um, we feel very grateful and very humbled um, at the, report, at the uh, recommendations of these reports. Uh, I think that we are, uh, as Bob has said, we're sort of moving in the same direction of many of these recommendations but also look for this opportunity, I think, to learn from folks who've been looking at us from a, an independent perspective. Uh, and it's a, it's a perspective, I think, that we uh, value a great deal uh, and will benefit from. So I'll touch briefly on some of the recommendations uh, today, but I understand there will be breakout sessions this afternoon where there'll be a more in-depth opportunity to talk over the recommendations with, uh, with experts from our teams. Oh, sorry. Okay. So moving forward, um, I think um, PEPFAR has been an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary uh, experience uh, in terms of showing what can be done when there's focused resources, uh, a focused effort, and a commitment to to really move forward uh, and try and bring a public health good uh, into very uh, difficult and low resource settings. Uh, it is a disease-specific program, but I would hasten to say it's also served basically as a platform for health services in many of the countries where we work, where there weren't operational clinics or facilities. Primary care was often a haphazard or of low level. Um, laboratory services, drug commodities distribution. There were systems that came on board because of the opportunity to have a focused investment in HIV, which now are providing a much broader set of health benefits and can be built on uh, in the future. Um, we recognize, as Bob said, that some of the data collection for this evaluation ended at various points in time. Uh, and so we appreciate that you have seen us as a dynamic program, which continues to um, evolve and develop uh, over time. So I thought to spend just a moment on the changing environment that uh, PEPFAR is find, does find ourselves in. Um, I think, as Bob said, initially the uh, emphasis really was on uh, sort of a quick uh, needing to quickly get on the ground, get services, and sort of to slow down uh, the hemorrhaging of, of the loss of life from, from HIV. Uh, now we're moving into another stage uh, of actually being able to consider sort of um, an AIDS-free generation and what all that that means. That means that we need to look at everything that we're doing, I think, through the opportunity of the best data that we have, what's the best science we have around what's going to create an impact, what's going to drop incidents. So there are a lot of things you wish you could do, but at the end of the day, if you've got a certain amount of resources, we are now needing to really look through that evidence-based lens uh, and what we do. The second imperative really is to look at sustainability. We will not have done our job 
uh, if, if at any point in time things change and we don't have all these resources and people are dependent on these support. So it's critical now that we have to look at everything. We aren't acting alone anymore. We're really uh, embedded in working tightly with country systems. And that requires a new dialogue with partner country leadership. Uh, and putting countries in a different re in different role with our program where they convene, they lead, they develop the plans, it's their country, and we're there to help and support them in addressing the HIV epidemic together with the Global Fund, other donors and stakeholders. So it is a very different direction uh, than just charting the course alone at this point in time because that is not wise or sustainable. I mentioned the Global Fund because it is an entirely uh, new relationship that we've been privileged to have with the fund in terms of often doing country visits together, meeting together and planning together uh, with the government around who does what, who can bring what to bear, how do we look at having additive and not duplicative services so that we're truly complementing what resources we have to share. And then the bottom line here is, again, this is a much bigger program. It's a much bigger effort than PEPFAR. It's, it's a global response where countries now have a different relationship, I think, over time as the call has come from their own people as well as uh, the need to be accountable um, to, to those that they serve. So the success, I think you've seen quickly the, where we're at now in the most recent reporting year for which we have data. Uh, that nearly 5.1, well, it's actually a little over 5.1 million people are, were on treatment at the end of our uh, reporting year. The uh, mother-to-child transmission has definitely been accelerating. There's the global plan that we are uh, pleased to co-chair and partner with the 22 highest burden countries with our colleagues from UNAIDS. Uh, it's accelerating action in this arena, and I'm hoping that the next, the next tranche of reporting, you're going to see a, an even greater uh, uh, drop in our numbers. Um, to in terms of new infections. Uh, the care and treatment is an important part of our program. It's a changing part of the portfolio. Uh, it's one that I'll speak to a little bit more in, in time to come. Uh, but the importance of also continuing to focus on the vulnerable children and adolescents, I would add on that, is, is a critical piece of our work. And male circumcision is definitely ramping up. It is a it is not an easy road. Uh, there's a lot of work that we do with country partners around that intervention, but it has such a clear benefit that it's worth every bit of the work. So when we talk about dropping incidents, it is good to just look at what's been accomplished. This is data that's drawn from the UNAIDS Global Report in terms of taking some of the highest prevalence countries, uh, all over the 10% and far higher, over 10% prevalence, and look at what the change has been. So this alone makes, I think, all of the work that we do absolutely uh, worth it. And it's a, it's a call to keep, keep pushing hard to, to get these numbers way down. You've probably seen from the PEPFAR blueprint um, the graph that we've put forward in terms of the, we call it the tipping point. Uh, but really it is trying to look at changing the dynamics of the epidemic where you have more people beginning ARV treatment than new infections in a given year. And these numbers, again, are drawn from the UNAIDS global data. This chart needs to be updated a bit because it only shows seven countries uh, in the, under the 1.0, where which would be the ratio where there's an even number on treatment and starting uh, and new infections. The, 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 last two, the first two countries in blue, they're both Kenya um, and I'm having trouble reading from here. Uh, Rwanda have moved, uh, they have moved up. Um, to, uh, just to just under uh, a ratio of one, and uh, Haiti and, and Swaziland are just a hair over one. So they're very close to actually reaching that, which is rather extraordinary when you think of the burden of disease um, that those countries have held. So looking forward, uh, I think in PEPFAR's evolution, I think the charge and the opportunity uh, laid out for us is, is a big one, and you've captured it very well in, in the IOM report. We're in, a, we're in a dialogue with each country, I think, that's very different, uh, depending on sort of the capacities of its health systems. Uh, whether they're, often it goes with the primary care focus, other countries are putting an emphasis on decentralizing services. Um, through the national to provincial to, to district level. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of effort underway, I think, that the conditions where, where things stand in every country that we're working with. However, it is a critical response that, that we're moving forward. Um, and it takes time. It's hard work. It's a lot of dialogue. 
It's a lot of uh, countries needing to think through what they want and the decisions that they want to make. Um, but in that, I think that we have been able to, um, to hold ourselves accountable and need to keep the focus on the results at the end of the day. So looking forward, um, the PEPFAR blueprint, I think, is something that you um, are all uh, familiar with at this point. It was released by Secretary uh, Clinton uh, in World AIDS Day uh, last year. And basically, this schematic lays out the uh, four main principles. Each one of these has a roadmap with specific steps and action steps that PEPFAR is doing now and will continue to do. Um, this is also, I would hasten to say, this is something that we don't do alone. It is very much uh, a global responsibility. Um, and we are joined by that in uh, not only country governments, but I think uh, multilateral and other bilateral donors, academics, civil society, uh, is going to take all hands on deck to, to make this uh, real. So the main principles that are underlying the, the uh, concept of the AIDS regeneration and the blueprint um, are all noted here in terms of both looking, again, I mentioned to be very clear about what the data is that guides the decisions that we make and where the investments are. Uh, the importance of not, of not doing this alone, this is, a, this is a big effort now that needs to be convened with multiple parties and stakeholders in the effort. There uh, is a critical focus uh, on gender issues, gender equality. Again, not, women, not only men, women and girls, but men as well. Uh, and looking at the impact of vulnerabilities on, on the dynamics of the epidemic and transmission. The stigma and discrimination continue to be a continued challenge. I think it will always be there for us as we look at some of the countries now and the issues that are confronting MSM on LGBT individuals uh, who are at risk trying to access care, trying to access prevention, are at risk of identifying themselves. Um, the work is is uh, a lot yet to do, but it's one that uh, we have to keep in mind and, and keep plugging on. And then I think we need to also be looking at uh, doing more with what we have and always looking for where we can find efficiencies in our programs um, that allows the resources to have a greater impact. So as we look forward to the recommendations, I think, again, uh, we'll hear more specifics on these uh, in the afternoon sessions, but I just wanted to touch briefly on each of these going forward. So the prevention, uh, the prevention re uh, review of prevention, I think was very thoughtful uh, and very well done. Um, we then the focus on preventing sexual transmission, particularly as is still a major driver of the infections. Um, we have put out the guidance for uh, prevention of sexually transmitted infections in 2011. It's now being started to be manifested in the COPS and the country operating plan. But again, it was looking at how would, you, how would a country build its program based on its epidemiology, based on its data and its risk populations. What does your prevention portfolio need to look like uh, to, re to respond to that? And I think it's easy to, to try and say prevention is this or prevention is that. It's biomedical, it's behavioral, it's structural. It's all of those together. I think in any example that you want to pick, those things come together. In PMTCT, for example, uh, the there has to be demand creation to bring women into care. There has to be a mobilization of support to get to antenatal care to take testing. The biomedical intervention would be the ARVs, a prophylaxis for transmission. But then the structural intervention is male partner involvement as well. We've learned that the importance of that uh, and, and the environment at home uh, is critical to reaching women and successfully keeping them in that cascade. The implementation science and combination studies are all areas where PEPFAR has been uh, placing investment. I think it's helping. We need to be sure that what we're doing are the right things, that what we're doing is the right combination, the right coverage. Uh, and again, that will vary by, by population served and by uh, factors in the country. But we need to keep improving what we do, and this is the way that we want to move forward and work with, with all those of you on the committee who made suggestions in this regard. And I would just say again that treatment as prevention remains one of the most highly effective and protective interventions. It's not everything, but it's an important and critical piece. On care and treatment, uh, I think this is uh, treatment, obviously, as I've mentioned, is a, will be a critical element in continuing to drop transmission and incidents, uh, new incidents. But we also look at the importance of retention and care and adherence uh, is central to keeping that treatment investment and making it effective. We recognize that the retention issues particularly are one where we're spending a lot of time 
uh, and folks can go into that a little bit more in this afternoon. We have one indicator now, which is retention and treatment at 12 months' time. And that in and of itself, I think, is not adequate, and, and we're recognizing that. But the, a new area of work for us really has been to put a new focus on quality management as well. This is really important as we're, tr as we're looking to increasingly embed our programs in the public health programs of countries that, uh, that as we're not always the one in the front line delivering the care and service, but the quality of care is being maintained, that the cascades are, are being followed. So we've got an initiative now that's, that's undergoing to develop a quality strategy and we'll be starting with the clinical services as the first, uh, as the first area of focus on that. Would also comment, I think, on the importance and the effectiveness of community-based care and linkages, uh, Bob, that you had mentioned to upstream facilities. This is an area where we've put a lot of attention um, and increasing attention. Again, again, as we sort of look and we are working with government in their clinics, these linkages and the ability to keep a care, uh, a care linkage together, a cascade together, so that you have people in front of the right knowledge on the right level of care that they need is critical. Um, we have an ongoing review now of sort of our care and support services. Again, as treatment has changed, as the environments have changed, I think we're recognizing that we want to take another look at those to be sure that what we're supporting are really the most uh, effective and how do we partner with Global Fund and others to make the picture whole at the end for people to stay in care. FR uh, has always had a strong and ongoing commitment, I think, to excellence in programming for orphans, for vulnerable children, uh, and increasingly now adolescents must be, we must be serving adolescents. Um, since the report was finished, your data, we did release uh, the new OVC guidance, which had an extensive literature review uh, as part of it to help guide our programs in programming that. That has just, is just being incorporated now, so the next year or so is, in our planning cycle, these things come around when we do the COPs and the planning. So the evidence of that will begin, we expect to begin to see that increasingly in our programs. We recognize, I think, very clearly that there is a need for improvements in our measurement and evaluation in these programs. And I think and that is now underway as part of a broader new evaluation strategy, which is uh, in, in the works for PEPFAR. I would say that we recognize a critical need for expanding pediatric treatment. Uh, we are way below the curve in pediatric treatment. We're around 22% coverage, where with adult treatment, we're around 60 or so percent coverage across PEPFAR programs. So that speaks to a real need both for case identification, finding kids who are positive, and then having systems of care that keep them and get them and bring them and keep them in care. Uh, the importance of focusing on youth could not be under, uh, overstated in any way, particularly young girls, where we know that they have many, many vulnerabilities uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of their risk. Things like keeping them in school, uh, keeping job skills or training opportunities, anything that reduces those risks, both in our gender programming as well as in our adolescent and, OBC, and our OVC programming are areas that we see are important. Um, I mentioned gender briefly, but I think I've come back to that and just sort of say we, uh, it's, this is an area of work that has become increasingly embedded and important in how we think about prevention, care, treatment. Uh, specifically, we've put a lot of work specifically in gender-based violence and scaling up those efforts in multiple countries. Um, the importance, I think, here are both looking at strategies and policies as well as sort of the community environment. Um, you have to look at things that uh, put people at a disadvantage. There's a lot of social economic inequities. There's stigma and discrimination uh, across, across risk groups um, that uh, merit a lot of attention, and uh, we can speak more at that. But also, I think it is an area where I think increased work in how do you monitor and evaluate the impact of your gender, uh, focused interventions to understand their impact. It's a relatively new area for us, and it's an area where I think uh, we're going to be benefiting from a lot of thoughts that the committee's put forward. Um, the the uh, need to look at sort of where we're going in health systems, I think, um, and what the impact that this program has been on health systems uh, is is uh, a rich area for work. I think the, the uh, report uh, particularly pulled out a couple of areas on the health workforce. 
on supply chain management and also sort of on resource uh, fiscal um, financial resources being mobilized as particularly important areas uh, going forward. This builds upon other systems which are now more uh, a little farther along in their development, laboratory and clinical care systems, health information systems, all of which are part and parcel of delivering a package of HIV care and services, but um, are speaking to the broader health systems of the country. So I think a particular uh, and exciting area of work for us has been looking at the application of some of the financial tools and methodologies um, that help us look at our programs from uh, a lens of are we investing in the right place, in the, doing the right things, in the right amount? Are there ways that our costs could be reduced, whether it's a service delivery model that's we used, or whether it's uh, economies of scale in, in how we deliver services, um, all of which will help us to spread our dollar farther and I think also help the larger system of health in the country. The transitioning to a sustainable response is going to be uh, um, a key focus, I think it has to be uh, going forward now. And again, I've touched on the role of country as convener and coordinator uh, of this larger effort. We are a partner there. Um, our commitment is strong and durable. Uh, we, the responsibilities we've taken on to start people on treatment uh, to save lives is, remains real as countries come in and are assuming over some of those responsibilities for the planning and the oversight and the management, and eventually some of the funding. Different countries are in different, are in different places on that. Um, but there's progress, I think, in, in everywhere, everywhere that we're working. The roles do are changing. Um, our teams need to change on the ground, uh, and we need to change our dialogue. It's much more of a diplomatic dialogue. Uh, with, with country leadership now than it's ever been before, and that's, that's the right thing to do. Um, I think you need to have the attention uh, at all levels of government, all the way down, also down to the district and local levels uh, where a lot of decisions are actually being made. Knowledge management is uh, a large area for work, and we're particularly grateful to the committee for uh, the thought that you have been uh, have given us in terms of some of the important features uh, of this work. PEFAR is in the process now, sort of an overarching um, re-looking at, at, at how we do things, how we measure them, and what framework that we're working on. This will result in some operational guidance, uh, some updating of our indicators, and again, looking at our financial tools uh, to help us uh, think through uh, and make sure that we're working as effectively as possible. The, uh, there are new, uh, there are large, a large stepping back and looking at evaluation, I think, more broadly and, and how we want to improve on that. And also some new methods that we're looking at in terms of disseminating our, of our information. Uh, in a few months, there's, uh, there will be, we will be launching a more widely available data on foreignassistance.gov. Uh, that, how we are putting that together right now in terms of making things more readily available and easily digestible is under internal, internal review, but that is something that we are committed to trying to uh, be open around what we, what we can show so that we can all be thinking together around improving our work. So the next steps for us on the IOM recommendations, we've convened an interagency committee. Um, of all the PEPFAR agencies and partners to go through these recommendations specifically. Uh, we will be working on an action plan going forward, uh, looking at those that may be short-term, long-term, intermediate-term, uh, where we can take steps and where we think uh, we can uh, benefit from a lot of the good work that's been done. And then these will ultimately come out and uh, these will inform how we look at both when we're reviewing our COPS uh, in just a month or two, and then how we plan and give guidance to our, our next year's uh, country operating plan guidance. So we cannot uh, express our appreciation enough uh, for the work that you've done, and uh, we very much look forward to the rest of the day when there will be more opportunity for discussion on each of the recommendations. Thank you.